Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, portfolio management during crisis number three. Um, I decided three weeks ago to try to help some of you uh, because the market was volatile and I, and I hope it's helping some of you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been trading for the last 20 years as a hedge fund manager and a pop trader and I've been mentoring traders since 2004. Um, so the format of this hour is the same as the, the previous two ones. Uh, the first thing that I would like to go through is the situation across asset classes. Uh, why? Because the market is moving big time. And as it is moving big time, there are big changes from one week to another. And I think it is important to understand what is the price action telling us. So let's start with the price action and quickly looking at um, at the different asset classes. So I would like to start first with the um, S&P 500. So if you remember last week when we uh, talked about the market, uh, that was the end of the month, the end of the quarter, and the market was quite squeezy. And we look at the different levels and we identify 2630, 2640, 50. Um, and the market went up, this, up, up to this level. Why? Because there was a huge discrepancy on a monthly basis and a quarterly basis of mutual funds that have to uh, buy back shares and selling some bonds. Okay, so that was the end of the month rebalancing. And since the end of the month, uh, so actually it was quite weak on the last day of the month, then the market has been weakening. And now we are at the 2500. Uh, and I think what I like to use here, because the volatility is so high, so high you need to adjust your charts from daily weekly now to uh, literally uh, hourly so if i look at the chart and, and what i want to be looking here is the uh, s p futures the es why because it's trading 24 7 and and really this is the one that people should be looking at these days um, and again we see the different levels so if we look at the level here we can see that 2640 was a big level there is not much between 2640 and 2740 uh, in the meantime, we broke the, the downside leg that we had before. I still want to believe that uh, the, the risk is on the downside and massively on the downside. Uh, we see, I mean, obviously tomorrow we get the big number, we get the NFP. Uh, this is a lagging indicator, but everyone <laughs> is, is, um, is looking at this number. Why? Because um, if we think that uh, there, there might be six to seven percent you know unemployment on top of the three percent we can have like a figure of ten percent very quickly uh, and that's going to be making the headlines in the meantime i want to uh, as you uh, as usual be looking across asset classes um, and i want to carry on with something that we have not covered yet much which is the european banks uh, why the european banks because there have been some concern over the last 10 years of the let's say the quality of the European banks. And as you can see the chart, so this is the stock 600 for the European banks, um, which is very close to the old time lows. So despite the market bouncing back by 10%, 15% in Europe and in the US, uh, banks in Europe have been pretty, pretty, very weak. Um, and here, uh, so that's the, as I said, the stock 600. Here, this is Santander, um, Santander Spanish bank. Uh, but um, similarly, HSBC. So HSBC has been has been really a dog, and, and why? Because it has exposure to to everything that you don't want to have exposure to, which is Europe and which is which is Asia. Um, but actually, over the last uh, couple of days, HSBC has been weakening big time. Uh, so it's making new new uh, new time lows. Um, uh, similarly, because I know that some of you are, are listening and, and are in, in Asia and, and in Australia, I wanted to look at some of the Australian banks. Uh, so let's move into, uh, instead of being an early chart, I should have been looking at on, on a daily chart. Um, so if I go to daily chart and if I go back into HSBC, so that's the chart for HSBC. Uh, for JP Morgan, this is the chart. Um, so the, this is really the weakness that the market is experiencing. Actually, you can see as well that JP Morgan, which is really a market leader uh, for, for, uh, for the banks and, and, and really a market leader for the whole S&P has been very, very weak. 
Um, so it, it, it clearly tells you that there's going to be further weakening of uh, real assets, uh, and that's a concern. So that's for for the stocks. Again, I will I like to look at, at at the different sectors, at the different stocks. But here I wanted to uh, to more be looking at the banks. If you think about the the banks, they tell you a lot about the health of the economy, and that tells you about the let's say that the, the worrying a state about uh, what's going to happen next into real assets and the real economy. Um, similarly, something that we we uh, um, discussed over the last couple of weeks is the state of uh, the credit market. So we looked last week at the LQD, which is the investment grade ETF. Same for the municipal the, the munis. Um, so they have been very weak. They have been bouncing a bit. Still, uh, it's not coming back to the all-time highs, despite uh, uh, the Fed effort to do to be very active. So we're going to be discussing at the end of this call about uh, possible ETF dislocation and what to be looking when we'll be looking at ETF. Um, but clearly the credit market is, is trying to recover. MBS is still weak. Uh, some ETFs are weak, some names are weak. Um, so I, 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 when I, I discuss that with my mentees these days, I use this analogy is Everything was traded 100, um, let's say, a month ago. And now uh, the Fed put a bit at 80 cents on everything. So they put, they said, OK, I'm sitting on the bit everywhere. 80 cents, 80% 80 of the face value. And that was for the credit market, um, for currency in a sense. So everywhere they were at 80 cents on the dollar. Um, so the question now is, are we, for, we going to be forcing the Fed to be way too long and, and having to unwind. Uh, so that's something that I discussed on YouTube, which is, you know, the size of uh, the balance sheet of the Fed. And I'll try to do a second one tomorrow or, or, or next uh, to identify the size of the, cent of the central bank's balance sheet versus um, the GDP. So that's for the credit. The credit, I mean, uh, we're gonna see that over the slides as well is still pretty weak uh, because there is this location and, and and the first reaction that we had we had deleveraging from many uh, uh mutual funds funds hedge funds whatever uh, and i think now the risk is on real redemptions why because people will need real money and when people need real money they need to withdraw and and to sell some of their exposure to the equity market to the bond market so uh, we could see in the next couple of months some redemptions that gonna affect uh, um, and that's gonna be a follow-up of what we've seen the first reaction of the deleveraging okay so um the spy versus the russell so that's the big caps versus uh, uh, um, the um, the small caps all the all those charts are the charts that we should be following these days um, in terms of currencies, before going into commodities, um, as we will see in another slide, is the Fed is trying as much as possible to provide the market with a uh, uh, US dollar. Uh, why? Because the, the central uh, banks across the world and emerging markets, for instance, that have been printing dollar bonds are now trying to get access to bond. Um, and having said that, uh, uh, the, the, the strengthening of the dollar, if I might say, has been weakening, uh, okay? So uh, why? Because again, the Fed has been extremely pushing uh, over the last couple of weeks to provide US dollar. Uh, so that's on, on the currency side. For the commodities, obviously, I mean, that's maybe for me only, but um, I'm looking a lot into WTI. So for those of you who follow me on Twitter yesterday, on, uh, I was um, I tweeted uh, around that time that uh, WTI was felt very very squeezy. Um, uh, why? Because uh, 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 Trump was making all he all he can, and actually the Russians started to talk about you know uh, uh, um, WTI not to go lower. And today we had a lot of talk. I don't know if you traded WTI. I traded WTI today. I mean, it was a good trade. Um, uh, um, but um, I think it tells you about the importance of, uh, of looking at the price action. 
Um, so me uh, here, I consider that you need 80, 90% to be a trader and you need to feel the market. And feeling the market means you need to listen to the, the, the market's music. So the market is telling you something and you need to listen. And what I do every morning, because some of you asked me, you know, Greg, how do you do it? Every morning, how do you do, how do you know if it's risk on or risk off, which assets uh, to be looking? Every morning I do the same. I look at all these asset classes and I go one after the other and I say, okay, what is the price action telling? And I know that it can, it could change. But the thing is, if you do that from, from the morning to the end of the day and you see that WTI is not making new lows and actually is squeezy into the end of the sessions, that tells you that actually it's something is happening that has not been happening since the, 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 the 50s. Um, and today we had the news. I'm not saying that that was an easy trade, but you should as much as possible be listening to um, and, 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 and feeling those, those moves. So WTI, we're going to discuss that today. This is really interesting. Um, again, the market, if you look at the move today, the market was very, very slow to react to the Trump. And I think discussing with other traders, it feels that the algos that were quick to react, let's say a couple of months ago, to any news that was hitting the tape. Now they are off because they don't know how to do it because the market is not liquid enough. So that means you, if you are actively trading these days, you can have, you get a lot of time to be uh, uh, um, uh, buying or selling something on the news. Um, so that's for the uh, uh, WTI. We discussed uh, copper, we discussed gold before. So here, this is the commodities. Uh, I don't want to be missing anything, but I think we should be jumping now into, uh, into the slides. So the slides, today we're going to try, after the situation across asset classes, we're going to try quickly to be talking about, you know, Q1 review. So that's uh, back trading, where we're going to be making a lot of money. We're going to be looking at oil market. We're going to be looking at credit dislocation, earning season, S&P open interest, ETF dislocation, and, uh, and open interest uh, that I'm putting twice. Um, so let's start with, uh, with what we, we, we've seen uh, over the, uh, the first quarter. So instead of being today, that should be uh, Q1. Uh, so that's the, the performance of asset classes in Q1. Um, and as you can see, and you know it already, so again, I don't want to be spending too much time on it. And that was a couple of days ago, so it changed actually quite a lot in between. But you see that uh, the defensive assets have been doing their jobs. So uh, again, this is something that I discuss during two or three videos through the 4 by 4 video series is understanding where to put your money uh, when you, depending where you are in the credit cycle, in the economic cycle and where you are in markets conditions and and the ones that have been very weak we know that it's oil but actually russell uh, so small caps mid caps are we have been really underperforming the big caps so that's the chart that we've seen before and then we can do the same job with the sector to me it's it's extremely helpful to understand the price action again because that tells me a lot about what's going on. So in a sense, you know, only looking at the price action, you can, you can understand how the market is behaving and then you can do um, your, your uh, uh, ID generation. So that is for, for Q1. Again, that helps me. Uh, if you can do that uh, every day, you can do that, do that every week. Uh, I'm really advising all my mentees when they start the mentoring, you know, to try to put in place those uh, screenings because you know if you don't have the time to be looking at the market on a daily basis every week coming back and understanding what I've been doing is extremely helpful. So today I want to spend some time on WTI. Why WTI? Because as I told you, I tweeted uh, uh, WTI yesterday. I think it was it felt squeezy. Uh, the only asset classes that I've been trading is the majors and WTI over the last 10 days. Um, so we discussed last week uh, Total and um, I think it was BP where I was short and uh, then it broke the support. Then, you know, uh, uh, the resistance. So when it broke the resistance, you know, you cut the position. So first thing first, if we go and maybe I can go into the chart here. 
maybe that's going to help you. So if we think about uh, Total, because not only because I'm French, but because I think this is a good uh, leading indicator for, for the whole market. Uh, where is my Total here? Total is so. up. Okay, so that's the chart of Total. So you can see it was uh, uh, um, uh, going into the 33s, then it went higher. So that was a good in leading indicator. And if you look at BP, uh, for those of you who are more trading UK market, uh, that's the same story. But if we go back into the spreadsheet or this um, slide, should I say, is I want to be looking at WTI and, and the future contract. So WTI, which is oil, is trading with a cash, which is the monthly, uh, the, 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 the future on the contract for this month. And then you have forward contracts. Okay. So it, it, uh, as you can see here, the cash is trading at a lower level than the future, okay? And actually, why is it trading at a, future, uh, at, at a higher level? Because it's, 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 it's called as being in contango, okay? So where future contracts are higher than the cash. So the interesting thing here is the cash is at, uh, so that was yesterday, and sorry, I didn't, because the market, changed so, so much but that gives you the idea uh, so at yesterday we were at 2050 uh, in the afternoon and if you take the same contract one month later uh, one year later sorry you end up with a differential of 40 percent so that gives you a huge steepening curve uh, uh, oil curve so the difference between some of you probably understand why the difference between the cash and the futures is the cost of carry uh, of holding oil. So here you get a huge carry. And that means what probably, and this is something that I discussed with one of my ex-mentees a couple of days ago, is the cost of carrying oil exploded recently. Okay, so if you... If you wanted to be long oil, maybe what you could do is buying oil um, at 2050 and holding this oil and putting them where? In a tanker. So this is why we're going to be looking at the tanker. But first, um, when the market is so much in contango, that means there is huge disruption. And as you can see here, the con uh, uh, there is huge contango in the first two to three months. So it's like the market is telling us it's going to be Armageddon for the next two to three months. Then the market and the economy should recover from September onwards, October onwards. But until the end of the summer, we should not expect recovery. Okay. So if the contango is so high here, there is an, incent an incentive to store oil and and the best way is to do uh, through oil tankers. So very quickly, because oil move today, and I and I wanted to give you uh, an understanding of what is happening. So in orange here, you have the oil curve structure at yesterday, okay, and 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 in blue you get uh, the oil structure today. As you can see, the um, the close part of the yield, uh, not the yield curve, but the oil curve has been moving up, okay? Whereas the end, uh, the long dated part is still the same. So that tells you really the market was scared and is still scared about, you know, the next two, three, four months. And, but, but now it, it is moving a bit. So that's here, I have, uh, um, I found this uh, tweet from, from MacroCharts, and probably you should follow them on, on Twitter. They come with good ideas. Um, and, and, and the idea was to, uh, to show, to look at the oil contango. Um, and, and yesterday, the oil contango, as I said, was around 40%. And uh, uh, this oil contango at 40%, as you can see here, is the same level that we had in 2008 and the same that we had in 1986. And very often uh, here, that, that might be a good entry price, okay? So again, we need to be extremely cautious when we say, because it happened uh, before, it's gonna happen again. But you started to have good signal 
that oil at least was uh, ready for a bond. So you have the price action, you have the history, plus you get Trump every day saying, look guys, I need to help my friends who are long oil in Texas. And then you had, um, we had the Russian as well jumping. Um, so the way for us to be playing oil uh, 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 and for retail traders, we, so you do have like the ETF uh, USO, but here we, we, you need to be extremely careful with USO because actually the contango is, is killing this ETF. So why, uh, uh, so that's from Bloomberg because I'm not smart enough to put it in, in, in the good words, but uh, it comes for when, when the contract is expiring uh, uh, and the USO shifts to tracking the following month future. So you are selling the, uh, the, the monthly contract, which here was what, 2050, and you'll be buying the next contract, which is at $23. So each time you're gonna be losing this contango. So uh, uh, USO is, is only good uh, for very short term. So if you're thinking, okay, I want to be buying oil now because I want to be holding oil for the next six months, you should not be doing that because you're gonna be absolutely murdered by the contango. Um, so today I didn't uh, trade the USO, I traded the, the future because the future as well is much more liquid and it's quick. So to give you an example, I think we should be jumping here on chart. Uh, so that's CL. Okay. So let's do, let's do a unit one. Okay. So that's the chart on, 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 um, on an intraday basis. Okay. So uh, you had the news. So you had the news around here. So I was short total. I closed my short total. So I was short total in the U S and I bought the future here. Uh, so what, what can I do here? So I bought the future at 23.20 and I sold at 26.20. Uh, so I make three figures. Um, and uh, why not because, because I'm smart, just because I was ready. Okay, so the thing is when you know that one asset is, has a good chance to be moving, uh, you need to be ready for the move. Okay, and as I said, as the algos are very slow, here you have a chance to be quicker than the algos because people, you know, are, are just, they, they are afraid these days. So there is huge opportunities uh, to be trading. Plus, you know, again, the price action was, was really helpful. So let's go back into the, the slides here. The contango, have a look at it. Understand, try to understand the concept of contango. Um, but, but again, why I'm, I'm mentioning that? Because the tankers have been extremely strong. So this is something that um, to the 4 by 4 video series, when I do the mentoring, that I call the second derivatives, okay? So very often what's gonna happen is when we're looking at IDs, when we're looking at the economy, we're gonna be missing some moves, okay? Because we are not perfect and it's hard to always see everything. But what you cannot be missing is the second derivative, okay? So if you have a move in oil and you haven't seen oil going from 50 to 20, that's fine. But we cannot move the second derivative. So if we think about contango, what is happening, what is contango? People want to store uh, oil. And to do so, they, they need to buy tankers. They need to rent tankers. And this is why a stock like Frontline in the US has been uh, very strong. So why? Because the cost of hiring carrier, or, or you know, those mega uh, 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 carriers went from probably $100,000 to $250,000 every day, okay? So think about the second derivative. I really like those trades where you, where you might have missed the move on an asset, on, on an underlying, but you need to think, okay, what's gonna be affected next? So if you think, about uh, um, uh, this one, the move started mid mid March, um, so you had plenty of time to make your uh, to make your work and going along the tankers. Uh, let's move here. So that's the same here with the HT, um, and and I want to explain to you very quickly 
And if you do the, for the ones that have done the mentoring, you know my style, which is always shortcut. I'm, I'm not pretending to be the best at anything. I'm just trying very quickly to get the picture. So, so again, that was from Reuters. So the daily tanker rates have rocketed to record highs of over 230,000 a day this week and reached 200,000 uh, a day level around March 12. Okay. So if you take the 770 super tankers in the world, each of them are carrying a maximum of 2 million barrels. So I make this quick calculation. If the cost per month is $200,000 times 30 days, that costs me 7 million, okay? So if I put my oil, it's gonna cost me 7 million, and 7 million divided by my 2 million of storage, I need a differential between one month's calendar future of $3.45. Okay, and this is what you are. If you don't have this, then the contango is uh, uh, or, the, uh, or, or, or doing the tanker business is not worth doing it. Okay, so that's something that uh, uh, you need to be able to do. It, it's not that complicated, it's more about you know putting in place your infrastructure and knowing what could be moving if the asset is moving in a certain way. Um, after WTI, as I said, is very squeezy, I felt very squeezy. I think the Trump administration is desperate to see the oil bouncing. Why? Because uh, uh, in, it, it is helping a lot. And, and Texas, for instance, is big into oil. If oil is at $20, that means this big state is under huge pressure. Um, so the reality is people were thinking that the first move is really good for the consumer but this is not a question of good for the consumer because it is a question of demand so oil is down uh, uh, from 50 to, to 20 because there is 20 percent demand uh, destruction um, so even if the saudis and the russian are cutting production by 10 millions you still get an imbalance of 10 millions but clearly uh, uh, there is there there is there are a lot of talks for for oil at the twenties. You don't want oil to be too long uh, for too low uh, too low for too long uh, below the twenties because it's going to be uh, really a disaster for for a part of the U.S. economy and as well for the high yield market. Um, quickly, credit market. Um, so that's something we, we discussed last week. This is the, the FRA versus the OIS. This chart again is the same, but that's the, so it's come uh, uh, from marketyear.com, uh, which you can follow on Twitter. They are very helpful. They put a lot of data of content. If you don't have a Bloomberg, if you don't have a Reuters, uh, extremely helpful. And again, uh, so the FRA is the, the forward rate agreement where the key rate is the three months and the OIS is the overnight index swap rate. So th that is a proxy to understand how costly it will be for banks to borrow in the future. So uh, it's, it's, worse that last, it's worse than last week. It's a bit better than a couple of days ago. Uh, still, uh, the situation is not great. And I think th that is clearly a good indication uh, why uh, uh, banks around the world and we are talking US, Europe, Asia, Australia are very, very weak because there is still uh, um, a deterioration of the, uh, uh, the underlyings. And as long as we don't, and, and, and that happens against uh, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan trying and, and other central banks to try as much as possible to help uh, uh, the whole sector and the credit market. So that tells you about the strengths of the weakness. Uh, another thing that I wanted to show you, and that is thanks to one of my mentees that uh, asked me, you know, Greg, where can I find the Europe high yield? Uh, and that, that is the chart of European high yield. So which was trading 58 not so long ago, went to 42, now is at 48. Uh, but that tells you about um, the weakness of the credit market, high yield uh, across the world. Uh, when you look at European high yield and what is into that um, that index, you do have like some Fiat, you do have like some Altis, you do, you do have like a bit of everything. Many, many names, but the credit market is really, really suffering. Uh, and why? Because we're gonna see uh, many defaults. 
we're going to see uh, probably companies going under and uh, uh, what governments and central banks are trying to do together is helping uh, through fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus uh, to help the economies which is a good thing uh, but uh, the cost is going to be extremely extremely high um, similar to last week and as I, we discussed at the start of this call, at the Fed announcements, um, I strongly advise you to put your name on their uh, uh, email uh, listings. Uh, so this week they made two very important announcements. The first one was on the 31st, um, where uh, banks, uh, where the Fed announced that banks could exchange their US treasuries for US dollar. So I think uh, it's not that I think clearly the goal, there are two goals here. If they don't want uh, um, international banks or anyone, any banks to put too much selling pressure on the US treasuries, meaning they don't want US treasuries to come down uh, 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 too much. Uh, so they don't want to be putting pressure on this market. And the second thing that is another way of helping uh, everyone to provide US dollar into the, into the system. Uh, so the, the world, the banks are desperate to get dollar. Um, so after the, the FX swaps that we have seen last week, uh, they started two weeks ago, they've done another one. They are still trying to provide the market with US dollar because the market is, is, is uh, demanding for more US dollar. And yesterday, because every day, the Fed is doing something. And again, that tells you about the, um, the collapse of some, some markets. Uh, yesterday, they announced that uh, uh, they will reduce uh, 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 some, um, uh, how do you say that, sorry, um, um, leverage ratio. So uh, on the leverage ratio, they were not, they were excluding US Treasury securities and deposits at Federal Reserve banks from the calculation of the rule for mortgage company and would be effective until uh, the 31st of March, 2021. So one year, and what's gonna give us is every uh, uh, um, banks which, which 250 billion more capital uh, will, will see one to 2% of the capital being freed. And, and why they want to do so, because uh, uh, the system needs uh, uh, need, uh, uh, cash. They need uh, uh, banks to deploy massively their balance sheet uh, because they're stressing the system. So again, very, very important to, in, to understand the size of the intervention from the Fed. So the Fed is, is, is reading the pack. That's something that we discussed. Uh, in the meantime, I think right now, uh, uh the, the fed uh, probably updated about their weekly size balance sheet um so we had over the last three weeks something like 1.5 trillion increase of the balance sheet that is uh, absolutely unheard uh, over three weeks that tells you really how stressed the market is uh, and that's gonna probably carry on um but uh, it, it, uh, the market is really, and central banks are trying to, to flood the market with, with liquidities. Um, so after credit, um, so we've done a bit of, of back trading. We've done as well a bit of forward trading with the WGI, because as I said, Twitter yesterday, and I think you need to be looking at the price action, what's going to happen next and what's going to happen next. So tomorrow we get the NFP. And as I said, the NFP is going to make the headlines and we're all going to be uh, saying, wow, wow. And for, on Twitter, you're going to see the charts and the numbers for probably two hours. Uh, but, you know, this is, at the end of the day, uh, uh, we know that those numbers are going to be horrendous. And if it's not tomorrow, then it's going to be for later. But really, for us, uh, what's going to happen next is, is the earnings season. So the earnings season is starting in 10 days. And I just wanted quickly to give you some kind of a picture. This picture is always changing because, you know, uh, uh, the analysts have to change their, their expectations. But um, uh, uh, here you get the numbers. So I use the Refinitiv uh, numbers Reuters uh, through Metastock. So here you get Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and you get the mean here. Uh, and so that will, have, that will give you the, the change quarter on quarter 
end the year on year, but uh, the expectations are for Q1 to be done 14%, 10%. Um, I think the consensus is still too high because if you look at the numbers that you have here, which is, um, so here you get the, uh, the, the 2019, but if you take this 2020 here, you end up with, um, I think I don't want to be misleading you, but uh, 140 something, so 40, 70, 150. So I think it, it's still way too high, okay? Um, the consensus gives you a correction of the EPS around 10%. Uh, Goldman has been talking 20, 30%. So what I use is, again, I think we discussed that last week, EPS of the S&P in 2019, 158. If the earnings are done by 20%, 158 minus 20%, that gives you roughly 120 US dollar operating earnings for the S&P. Okay, and that's not a blue sky scenario, but a good one. At 24.50 for the S&P, that gives you 20, 21 times earnings per share, okay, a P. So that's, that's pretty high. You can argue that we're not gonna have 120 or 130, we're gonna be lower than that. So you should be using some kind of, you know, again, shortcut where it's gonna give you your bottom, your top line. Uh, it's, it's never gonna be perfect, but at this level, you are paying 19 times, 20 times, a 20% downgrade, 15, 20% of the earnings. So this is not Armageddon style. Um, and I think at the moment, the consensus is a bit too optimistic. Uh, there are uh, some sectors that are gonna be absolutely destroyed, but more importantly, what you should be doing now is looking from now on, you know, when are the companies gonna come with their numbers and why you want to do so, because for each of these 11 sectors of the S&P, there are some market leaders and you want to know when is JP Morgan talking, when is Boeing talking, when is, you know, uh, Walmart talking, when they are giving their earnings because they, that's going to tell you a lot about each of those sectors. Okay, so uh, um, try to do your work now. Try, I mean, try, you do whatever you want, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> but uh, uh, what I will do is you want to be looking at those 11 sectors, price action versus the S&P, and trying to know when are the big companies coming with their earnings, because you want to be ready. So it's, uh, uh, you don't want to come every day and, th and looking at the price action after something happened. Uh, so earnings season, again, it's coming. So this is what's gonna happen next. Uh, you can already, be looking at stocks that you think have been absolutely hammered or have been uh, uh, um, outperforming the sector and you can you want to be ready uh, on your watch list and having some 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 prices some levels that you like or you dislike as a long and as a short uh, uh, but you don't want to be doing the work in the emergency when actually because the volatility is going to be so high you're going to be most of the time reacting badly so earning season, uh, as we've done last week, and I think this is very important because the market is moving so much these days, is you want to be looking at uh, the weekly expiry open interest. So that was done uh, an hour ago. So you need to be checking the levels. You can go on the cboe.com uh, website. So where are the significant level? So you can see the 2,500 is a big level. Um, they, um, check it tomorrow morning. And, and that's gonna tell you a lot about where the market could be landing at the end of Friday. Um, that helps me, that helps a lot of, of option traders. Um, that is extremely helpful. So as we discussed in the, into the introduction, ETF dislocation, I had many questions. I strongly advise you to follow this person on Twitter, Eric Bachunas from Bloomberg. Uh, why? Because the guy is good, he's, he knows what he's doing, he's an ETF specialist. And um, what is, is important is these days we know that there has been ETF dislocation, okay? Uh, and as well that over the last 10 years, the size of passive investment through ETF has been bigger and bigger. Uh, 
Uh, so we know that uh, 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 because of the size of the ETF, we should be looking more and more at what is passive investment and how it works. Uh, to give you an example, the, the squeeze that we had of the, at the end of the month uh, through market rebalancing uh, is, is another sign that passive in investment is so big. Uh, for those of you who have done the mentoring, you know as well looking at Gamma, uh, looking at uh, algos, looking at, at, at uh, who is really buying, um, th th that is helpful. So what we had recently is some of these um, ETF have been trading at a discount to NAV. So for any ETF, they have net asset value, which is the assets that they are holding. And they can be, the last price can be trading above or below this NAV. When it's trading below, we said that uh, the ETF is trading at a discount, and when it's above, it's trading at a premium. When it's trading at a discount, m that means people think that uh, uh, there is stress somewhere, that the assets are not liquid enough, so it will take, take time, for instance, to liquidate those uh, assets, so that needs to trade on a uh, at a discount. So that is what has been happening over the last months, uh, not everywhere. The first thing that you need to be checking when you buy or sell an ETF is to be checking the counterparty risk. And when I say counterparty risk is to be checking who is behind the ETF. If it's, uh, let's say, BlackRock or a small name. Why? Because if that is a small name, you, you know that there is, a ch there is a chance, not a big one, but a, a higher chance that this, this uh, 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 counterparty might default. So check the counterparty risk and the name. On the discount, what I find useful, and that's something easy for anyone to do, uh, is looking, so here this is Yahoo Finance, and I use the H H R H Y D. So the trade, the previous close was at 52. And here you get the NAV at 58. So you can see here that gives you more than 10% uh, um, discount to the NAV. If you are smart enough, or if you, are, uh, 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 if you want to, what you should be doing is be listing all these ETF and you run a macro through Yahoo Finance, even a guy like me can do it, even if I'm dodgy with macro and running the NAV premium and discount for those ETF. Why is it helpful? Because that's going to help you uh, uh, on, on knowing where is the stress. So if we take this ETF here, this is municipal. Okay, so the munis have been under massive uh, selling pressure, a lot of dislocation. Again, so you do NAV, you look at the last one and you compare the two. So I've been running the same yesterday. So you do all this ETF you running. So here, this is Metastock again, because that is, that is extremely helpful. Uh, and I've, take, uh, I've been taking the, the, the same name for Muni, for Muni ETF. I took three names uh, with different size from 2.7 billion to uh, 258 million, where I have the premium and discount. So if we look here at the chart, which is the chart of BAB, which is the exchange traded uh, here for municipalities, uh, it used to be trading at 35, went down to 22, bounced back to 29, but in between there is a lot of dislocation, which can be seen through the discount and premium. So again, if you can run those screening ETF, it's not gonna be always, but you're gonna see the pressure, or maybe not the pressure on ETF. For those who have been trading in 2015, uh, in August 2015, um, there was the session when we opened and there was like huge dislocation between the cash and the ETF. Okay, so when I was working in pop trading, the guys who are doing the strategy in the US made a fortune because they managed on the first two hours of that, they putting like huge size for a 25% zero risk immediately. So they put uh, something like 50 million long short and met 25% in two hours. 
Um, I'm not saying that uh, you can do the same because it's, it's, it's really hard. And what they were able to do is to do that on ETF, like um, a sector ETF for stocks, where you can have all the names and buying the names. Whereas here, it's much more complicated. And this is one of the reasons that there's ETF dislocation here because municipalities and some bonds are pretty illiquid. So you're just assuming that in the next two weeks, months, actually the cash is gonna follow the net asset value, if that makes sense. Okay, four by four video series. I mean, I've done that. It's just to explain to you what I do through the four by four video series. Again, this is a very uh, comprehensive video series where I'm, uh, I explain why we should not be failing and I understand why we are failing because I've done both professional and retail when I started. GDP understanding, why? Because the component and the drivers, I think now this is key uh, as we are, might be at the end of the cycle and where to put, uh, where to be playing the different asset classes, uh, the sectors um, and, and, and uh, um, how to allocate money. So that's asset allocation versus the economic cycle expected returns versus real, real, realized returns. I know that for, for some of you, it's, it's, it's hard to understand those two concepts. And, and as long as you don't have put any position and you'll not be facing the expected returns versus realized returns, you don't really, really understand uh, uh, the possible uh, upside and downside. Macro analysis, um, Extremely, I hope extremely helpful for you guys. The feedback that I have is it's, it's, it works well. Um, my whole ID process for by four video series mentoring is I really want you to have your own infrastructure. So it's not you coming back to me, um, which I'm fine with it, but I want you to, to build your own infrastructure and giving you all the tools, the websites, the spreadsheets, uh, really uh, uh, relying on yourself. ID generation, because I have a, a background of both a hedge fund manager with one minute to five years time horizon and prop trading, which is one minute to two months. Uh, I've done macro, I've done bottom up special situation, active trading. I want you to be able to try to make money in any market condition and across asset classes. Uh, quantitative and fundamental analysis. Uh, quantitative is the first part, which is, you know, doing your screening. If you take your universe of stocks and, and, and having the names that you want to be long and short, fundamental analysis. Here again, I don't want you to be the best analyst, but that's for you to have enough research uh, to be confident to be inputting long and short. So this is something that I put a lot of time and energy in the video series. I think that helped massively the subscribers. All of this is to build a strong watch list where you're gonna be having your technical analysis and price action. For those of, of you who know me, they know that I'm a bit boring for a risk management. Um, uh, I want you to have a risk management that is similar to the professional. Uh, so I'm, I'm putting a lot of energy time uh, uh, to make sure that you have a strong risk management. Then the rest is a learning curve. It's an endless uh, uh, um, process. Um, what about we do 10, 15 minutes on the Q&A. Um, let me try to see uh, Q&A, Q&A. Okay, how does the ETF manager respond to such dislocation when there is a 20% discount? Um, so what, when you are running a, 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 a ETF, uh, you Delta, um, I think, um, there is not much that you can do first when there is this location. Uh, actually, what, it, what was funny is for the first time, uh, the Fed was so scared about you know, uh, this location that they decided um, to, to intervene on the mini ETF and, 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 and bond ETF. So now they are buying ETF similarly to, uh, to the Bank of Japan. Uh, the dislocation tells you that um, actually your assets uh, there are part of your assets that you know, uh, uh, even if they are marked to market, that the market is so liquid that if you want to sell, you will have to be selling at a lower price. So I give you an example. If we were talking about stocks, if you were long BP, 
10 million dollars you could be selling for probably one percent if you were long 10 million dollars of a, a small ENP companies you will have probably to be selling at a five percent discount so if you were running an etf with only small emp and you had to sell everything or part let's say five to ten percent of your net asset of your asset you have to uh, 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 accept a discount of five to ten percent so this is where we have the discount um, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, the arbitrage is easy because as i said the arbitrage is only possible if you can be buying and selling the two legs the two legs here for the municipalities because the market there was no market uh, you could not do the arbitrage uh, hi gregoire great stuff do you read news before the market open and think how this could affect your positions and do you read other research or just do your own okay so research um, i used to have access to all the brokers in town okay from jp morgan goldman sachs blah 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 and now that I'm not in the industry anymore, as active as I was, I don't have access to it. And I, actually, I don't miss it. Uh, why? Because you, you need to make, I mean, it's, you need to do your own research. Um, what I like, obviously, is having the two or three triggers that people will be looking and if there is a news. And this is right now I got Reuters Metastock because with Reuters I have enough news to tell me you know what's going on but i don't need from one guy that is an analyst that is on the sell side sell side or let's say a, a, a sales trader calling me in the morning before the open telling me look greg you should be buying and saying that because i mean over the last 20 years um, i rarely worked with uh, brokers because this is something that I don't like to be doing you need to do your own work it's like working on tips um, so I've never been big into that the way to do it is you need to have your different uh, 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 Twitter accounts to follow you need to have the research on, on different websites uh, uh, and and you need to be ready so the thing again is you're gonna be missing many things but you know let's say every Sunday what you want to be looking and, and this is a tip that I had 25 20 years ago or more so 20 years ago my girlfriend at that time was working uh, so that she was doing an internship on the pit in Chicago and she was working for JP Morgan for three months and she came to me and she said look this guy it's impressive every Sunday evening he's working two hours before the week to make sure to know what's going to happen for the week and I remember that and now you know each week on the Sunday I'm looking at the market and say okay what's going to happen so we're going to have the Fed we're going to have the NFP we're going to have all the numbers I'm going to be looking at the different earnings and again every morning I will be like okay the, today we're going to have those two three three moments in the day where something is going to happen so if we look at tomorrow we're going to have the NFP we're going to have the ISM services and we're going to have Trump okay so Trump is going to talk with the oil uh, oil CEOs we're going to have the ISM services at three o'clock UK time and at 1 30 the NFP so that gives me the afternoon in between there's going to be some other news and this is what I like to do and try to be ready um Toby a question on bonds Grégoire with regards to bonds Will all the huge monetary and fiscal policy stimulus that have been announced, will this policy have any impact on how the bonds will normally behave in a risk-off environment? Could they fall in price when technically they should rise in such situation? I mean, this, this is the big question. Uh, and, and what what we had over the last, uh, the last months is there was no price discovery in the market. So the Fed there was no liquidity so the fed came and said i put the bid everywhere uh, uh, we know that um, uh, and it's not being doom and gloom okay i don't want to, to sound like doom and gloom this is the end of the world it's just that we know if you have been trading the market you know that liquidity has been drying you know that there is a lot of leverage and the recent events have shown that uh, uh, there is no price discovery anymore okay because it's too risky um, so 
what's going to happen next if you put more money in the system and you have diminishing returns from uh, uh, the different uh, um, QE it, 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 it's not going to be better it's it's probably going to going to get worse i don't have the timing but that's probably what we're going to have um VIX, VIX is backward looking and volatility has clearly fallen off a cliff. What is the metric for forward looking growth? VIX, VIX is the implied volatility. Okay. So that means the volatility in the next 30 months. And this is not the realized volatility. Okay. So VIX is giving you the implied volatility that the market, the volatility that the market is pricing in the next 30 days on the S&P 500 through the different options. Do you think we will be in a deep recession or also maybe a depression? <laughs> Look, on one hand, I want to believe in human being and I want to believe uh, as uh, uh, US history has shown that uh, uh, Americans are very good at bouncing. Okay, so there is no doubt that, um, um, and it's not being who are the greatest country on earth, it's just reality. Americans are really, really good at bouncing. Okay, um, and, and, and so you want, I want to believe that it could be quick, uh, but I think what you have is unfortunately, we were at the end of the economic cycle, we had a lot of leverage. And because of, of those two, end of the cycle, huge leverage and assets coming down, and, 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 and we need to, I mean, we need to understand, you all know that already, is the economy as the world economy has stopped. 60, 70% of the world has stopped. Uh, and if it stops for a, a couple of months or a quarter, it's already very painful. And it's going to be, talk, it's going to be taking another couple of months or more to restart the engine. Um, so I think there is clearly a chance of, uh, um, uh, strong recession. You ask me, and, and, and my background is more into the uh, stock market. I think the stock market is at 2,500 just because of fiscal and monetary, uh, but otherwise it should be much, much lower. Uh, 2,500 is the level that we had 18 months ago, uh, which is that there is no sell off yet. And, and, and looking at the EPS and the P, I think it's right. But if we print and we print, we could go much higher. Uh, so I give you a shit answer, which is if it goes up, I told you so. And if it goes down, I told you so. But I really think that the, 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 if we are facing the recession that we have these days, we should go much, much lower. And, and I think here, the reward, if you miss the upside uh, thing is, if it go much lower, I don't think that many people will have a lot of cash. Um, What's your opinion on those daily two times, three times, 10 times bear ETF? I think it's shit. Um, I strongly advise you not to be touching this uh, bear ETF or bull ETF. Why? Because if you look about the, the last month, uh, probably 30 ETF went under because they were still leverage. This is very dodgy. Uh, you already get access to leverage limited. Uh, but two, three, 10 times is only for retail traders and, and, and who don't do that. I, I don't see the point. Really don't do that. Um, because that means, you know, you don't want to have more than 20%, 30%, 20% max exposure into something. If you do two, three, 10 times, that means you're going to be way too leverage. Um, can you say what was the site, site that you use some charts from? Uh, yes, it's, uh, uh, what do I call this one? Of course, I know, but uh, trading view, trading view. Um, what else do we have? Uh, uh, you tweeted yesterday about VIX implied volatility discount on SPY falling to minus 45% versus XLK going to 46. I don't know what, what you're mentioning here. Um, so do you reckon that the short trading prohibition in countries like Spain and Italy will carry on during Q2? And if not, would this add much more pressure to the downside in European markets? So last week I had a similar question with uh, one of the French followers. Okay, so the French 
so what's the, what's the name? Uh, the IMF, uh, the AMF, uh, which is the French regulator, did the same and say completely banned uh, short on 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 on, on stocks. And uh, so I I'll strongly advise you to be looking at Natixis, uh, which the ticker is uh, KN, uh, uh, where the stock. Uh, and I mentioned at the start of the call. Uh, the, the, the stock, you know, closed at 385, and I told you, you know, it's probably a short. I didn't say that was that name, but that was the, the, the name of the bank. And now the bank is at 230. It's down, you know, 30 or 50 percent on the week. So that means if you want, if people want to reduce exposure, they will love to sell. They will have to sell. So it's it, it's really. I understand that you want to be blaming the traders and you want to be blaming speculation when everything is goes down. But tell me why, when everything goes up, no one is blaming anyone on leverage, on, on, on short sell, on blah, blah, blah. So I think this is a, a, a typical uh, a, a reaction that is useless. Um, uh, and, and, and why? Because you need to find the price discovery. Um, I understand that you do some pockets of, 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 uh, on short selling, for, uh, let's say from time to time on, on some financials, on some names. But overall, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You just, you, you don't make the market work as a market. What kind of volume indicators should we be looking at now? Uh, it's the same as usual. I think I've done a video on that. It's on, it's on YouTube. You should be comparing the volume, uh, the daily volume to three days, 10 days, monthly, and to see what is the trend, if there is a spike. This is something that I do every day. One for you, if you could, in this environment, timing is obviously much more difficult. Is there any statistics other than COVID-19 figures that can be utilized to try gauge the overbought and oversold areas? Um, again, I like to be looking, I think this is something that I try to mention today, Toby, is, is, is I like to look at price action. Uh, um, and here, this is, this is, why I'm saying, when I started to work, and I think I mentioned that in the, in another, uh, video is when I started to work, I had absolutely no idea about fundamentals about anything. I was um, I was a complete idiot. I'm still a complete idiot. And and what I was doing, I was only doing through uh, trading with price action. And to give you an example, um, when the market was flashing red, I was selling. When the flashing was flashing uh, green, I was buying. Um, so price action is key uh, 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 in terms of, of fundamentals we know that the economies are going to be destroyed what you need to be looking at is the drivers of the of, of, of the moment so if what is driving the market what is, where is the where is the tension these days the tension is on the credit market okay so me as a as a, as a stock trader, I know that I'm a second derivative to the credit market. Everything lies on the credit. So I look at muni, I look at high yield, I look at the treasuries, and then I think, okay, are we into a risk on and risk off? And that's it, okay? Uh, and same, I'll say, okay, if, why I, I, I said last week, I don't think that the market could go higher, much higher is because WI, WTI is weak. WTI is for me today the uh, uh, really the criteria to use for demand and supply. As long as WTI is shite, that tells me that there is no demand, and that tells me that the economies are really struggling. Um, uh, by what else do we have? Um, hi, Grégoire, Roberto, which instrument do you use to trade WTI? <laughs> Futures at a minimum size of 500 barrels, anything smaller that trades 24 days as one well instead of CFDs. Uh, Roberto, my friend, um, I, 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 I still owe you something uh, and I'm not forgot. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, as I said to you, USO, uh, which is the ETF, is fine if you try it short term. If you try it for more than one month, let's say because of the contango, you're going to be hammered. Uh, yes, the future WTI 
is 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 dollars, uh, which is a lot, and and that means you know you need probably if you want to diversify a hundred thousand dollar book. So this is what I did today, and this is why I traded WTI. Otherwise, you know, USO uh, that's the only one. But don't go for um, <laughs> The, don't go for for a long term position because of the contango you're going to be losing money. Um, what advice will you give for someone who does not understand how to set key prices level for trading in the short term? If you don't know to do it, probably don't do it. Um, so there is something that I always said uh, to um, to people uh, when they do the mentoring program is uh, uh, don't force the trade. Okay, and not forcing the trade is if you're not in control, and, and, and again, you're never going to be 100% in control when you do trading portfolio management. But don't do things that you can't do at, at, at a certain time and, and really uh, uh, not force yourself. Um, so, trading, you know, these days is, is extremely, uh, let's say, um, compelling okay having said that uh, it requires uh, as i said last week a different risk management it requires some skills um, i give you an example you know i said to you last week to some of you last week i traded uh, um, uh, total and bp and for a week uh, i didn't trade um, mostly because i have to take care of my kids but today i traded okay so i think you need to have some setup uh, some levels where uh, you want to be trading. You don't want to be forcing the trade. It's not because the market is moving that you're going to be making money out of it. My boss, when I started, used to say something that was key. There is good volatility and there is bad volatility. Okay, and the bad volatility is the one that is always going to be in your face. Uh, uh, um, and, and so don't force, uh, uh, again, it's not because it's moving that you should be doing it. Uh, for the mentoring, if you have questions on the mentoring and to do the mentoring, send an email to contact at Grégoire Dupont and I'll come back to you and we can have a Skype call and discuss either the mentoring or the 4x4 video series. Um, can you generate wells from option trading as a standalone technique? Look, I've seen, I, I sat next to very, very successful option traders so I, I i used to sit next to one guy who had a book before for hedge fund or a billion uh a billion option and then it went for a small book the thing is when you're small is is much harder um so you need to have a bit of, of of everything i don't want us i don't want you to be only trading one thing option work um I understand that people want you to believe that it works tremendously well uh, because it's, it's in, in their interest. I think you need to be careful uh, um, if you do the 4x4, if you do the mentoring. I like to do basic stuff uh, because I think I'm not smart enough to, to understand everything. And options needs to be simple. If you get the, the, the simple things, then you're going to do well. Um, Uh, le le for the person who is looking for 4x4 four four series mentoring, you should contact me directly. Um, trading ETF dislocation, uh, it's, it's again, it's hard because you need to be able to, uh, to have, so you want to be doing an arbitrage so where you buy the ETF and you buy the assets. Um, this is something that you can do for some names, but for the muni names, you can't do it. So it's a bit of a um, uh, dream trade but in reality it's very hard to do it uh, only professionals mostly professionals can do it and even uh, they can't all be doing it um, core long short position right now um, so I used to have some total um, because and oil majors because I like the oil uh, now I sold those ones uh, I got a lot of cash now. Uh, I got some old position, which are, you know, uh, 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 very old. I find it hard uh, uh, to find attractive uh, uh, stories here. 
Um, I'm looking, actually, I saw an, attract, an attractive one today, not for me, uh, from someone that I find, I find very, very good. So there are some names that I tried, uh, started to, to look at. Um, small, mid, uh, so it's mostly small, mid, and big uh, uh, with uh, uh, good balance sheet, uh, free cash flow generation, uh, but you need a bit of, 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 of dust to, uh, to set, to, to come down. So th there are names, uh, yeah. Um, do you think oil stocks really more after the CEO bailout? I don't know. Uh, uh, look, Trump is doing, Trump administration is, is, is trying as, <laughs> as much as possible to do, uh, to, to push the oil, um, to boil higher, to the oil higher. Um, uh, it's barely made of post part co uh, two coming. Uh, it, it is gonna come. I, I need to work on it. Uh, uh, I need to do something nice on it. Uh, so yes, if I have a bit of time, I will do it. Um, how many life position is ideal in the personal portfolio? How many and how many in the watch list? Um, I think, you know, in a market like this, you don't need to have like uh, too many positions because it's hard to handle. Um, so if you have a book that is 100 and you have maximum exposure of 10 for each of them, you want to have 10 longs and 10 shorts. So you're probably talking 20% max, uh, 20 position max in this market like this. Maybe it's 10 uh, with some active trading, uh, some core, some ETF. Um, so that's probably what you'll be trying to achieve. Uh, again, what you're going to have is in 10 days, you get the earning season. So you, you, you don't want to be coming into the earning season with many positions and those positions exploding in your face. Um, and, and this is really, what I will advise you to do is, is uh, work on your watch list. Um, and when I say watch list is, you need to have different time frames. Okay, so you want, if you have the setup, you can do some trading. If you have uh, one to three months, you need to have one to three months, two to six months, six months and more. Okay, um, Kevin, I'm not going to buy any Lululemon because I hate that stock and you know that already. Um, any other question? I think uh, that's it for today. Um, so thank you very much for joining. Um, let's try to do the same next week. If you have questions, please send me an email to contact at gregoiredupont.com on positions, on IDs, on whatever. On the four by four video series, that would be even better. On the mentoring as well. I think uh, it works well. Uh, feedback is great. Um, but uh, be safe. Uh, um, don't force the trade. And, um, and it's good to be doing those uh, weekly sessions. Trust me, actually it helps me massively for my trading. So it's a good thing. Talk to you next week or in between. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.